Believe it or not, we're going to be looking at Nineveh again. We're covering the prophet Nahum. I told you that we'd probably cover him this week because he was uh, the last one in the set of uh, prophets that dealt with the same basic time period. So uh, uh, so that's where we are tonight. Nehemiah is uh, another of the prophets who is a little bit difficult to track down in terms of when he lived, but we do a pretty good job. Um, he was born in, in Ekosh of northern Israel, but was a prophet of Judah, most likely during the reign of King Manasseh, uh, one of Judah's most evil kings. Uh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, which brings into focus why it was under God's judgment uh, regarding Israel. Uh, you may have been wondering last week when we were looking at, uh, at Jonah and Zephaniah why it was that Nineveh was being singled out and being brought up, but if you remember, before Judah was carried off into exile by Babylon, the northern kingdom had fell to Assyria. Uh, just as prophecies regarding the fall of Babylon began to be given for, um, for their role in pre persecuting God's people, Assyria was being offered warnings of impending judgment as well, and Nineveh, being its capital city, um, made it the focus of much of the prophetic warning. So this is yet another book that is focused on Nineveh. Now, I told you last week that uh, Jonah was unique, um, not because of the fact that it singled out Nineveh as the single focus of its, uh, of its prophecy, though that is a little unique. It doesn't happen much in Scripture where a non-Israeli group of people are being addressed entirely, where the whole focus of a book is just about another group of people other than Israel. Um, uh, as, we, as I told you last week, Jonah was actually, as you, and I think you could tell as we read through it, was actually more about the man Jonah than it was about Nineveh. Very little is actually even said to Nineveh in the book. We hear a little bit about it, and we, we hear more about Nineveh than actually speaking to it, and we learn a lot more about the man Jonah than we do about anything in the whole book. But this is the one book that is exclusively written as a prophecy against Nineveh. So it is, it, in that respect, uh, Nahum is unique. Uh, now I had, you know, in the back of my head, I had it that Edom was somehow connected with Nineveh, but I couldn't remember just how. So I, I looked it up this week, and as it turns out, Edom became a vassal state of Assyria back when the wicked king Ahaz was ruling Judah, about 730 to 716 BC. Later, the king of Edom swore allegiance to Nineveh, along with 22 other vassal kings, uh, early in the 17th century. Edom eventually joined with several others seeking to, de uh, to defect from Babylon, and they all met in Jerusalem. Even Edom met in Jerusalem to discuss it, but then later uh, Edom reconsidered their role and actually joined with Babylon against Judah and participated in their destruction. Now, after all of these things, Assyria was conquered by Babylon. And remember, so you don't get lost in all these terms, the northern kingdom, you remember how they went into exile before Judah, and the group of people that called them into exile was Assyria. Then later, ba um, Babylon carried off Judah into exile. Well, then towards the end of that exile period, Babylon conquered Assyria. And it happened about the same time that Nineveh fell. So Edom itself was judged um, also, but we will read about those prophecies um, another night. Now, I said this in order to complete, you know, kind of like a family portrait of Israel, because Edom, if you remember, were the descendants of Esau. And they had denied Israel safe passage through their land while they were still wandering in the wilderness. That's brought up in Numbers chapter 20, uh, verses 14 through uh, I don't remember. I don't. I think it's. I don't remember what chapter it is. Anyway, but I know it starts in, in Numbers chapter twenty. Um, so you know, so they've been they've been a, a a a big part of Israel's past for a while, and uh, because not only are they they related, they share the same basic bloodline, but they also became um, enemies of Israel 
uh, not only through the two brothers initially, but when they became independent nations, Edom did not treat uh, Israel with respect and, in fact, joined in with their enemies. Now, the date of this book of Nahum, by the majority of accounts, was around the 8th century B.C., but um, the reference, there's a reference, and we'll read it in, you know, when we get in there. And believe it or not, I, I'm giving you a lot of this background because I think it's going to help you if you keep it in your mind. And you go back and you read it later on, uh, comparing it as we go on through the Old Testament. All this is kind of kind of like fold into itself and make sense. Uh, it's not always going to make sense immediately upon you hearing it. I'm not expecting you to remember every detail I'm telling you right now. But it's there for the record, and it's there in writing on the website so you can refer to it. And later on, hopefully, all the cards will fall into place and make a big panoramic for you. I'm not expecting it's going to do it at its first mention right now. So don't freak out by all the information because quite honestly, Nahum is a very short book. So we're going to be wrapping up very quickly tonight. It's not a super long book and there's no sense in going further with other books because they don't even deal with none of us. So we'd have to open a new subject and not finish it. So we're tonight's going to be relatively short, but I thought this background if you pay attention, and if you, especially later on, when we get to the book of Isaiah and other books like that, look that back on this, you're going to get a big panorama of uh, before Israel ever went into exile, get a picture of when the northern kingdom went to exile and the prophets that were associated with that, then when Judah goes into exile and the prophets that are, uh, that are connected with that, and then when they both, they all come back to their homelands and the lands that had held them in captivity, namely Assyria and Babylon, when they're being judged, will all make sense to you at that point because it'll be a timeline that'll unfold before you. Now, uh, again, but the, the date of the book by a majority of people, they date it for some reason, the 8th century, but I don't understand why because in chapter 3, verse 8 of this very book, it talks about the fall of Thebes Egypt, which is a, a city of Egypt, um, which didn't take place until 663 BC. And it's not, Nahum is not bringing up prophetically, it's, re, it's recording, it's, um, it's bringing up the fall of Thebes, Egypt, as an example to Nineveh, saying, if they didn't escape the good judgment of God, what makes you think you're going to? So it was obviously something that was in the past, and that happened in 663 BC. Um, <clears throat> so, we know for sure that this book was not in the 8th century. It was recorded in the 7th century, probably sometime after 663 B.C. Also, the fact that uh, Thebes, Egypt, was, event was restored just a few years later in 654 B.C., and that's not mentioned in the Book of Nineveh. It makes you think that very likely it was recorded between 663 and 654, so in that 10-year, less than 10-year window. But in any account, we know for, for, for a fact it was definitely recorded before the actual fall of Nineveh, which you guys remember last week was in 612 B.C. Actually, Nineveh began to fall under attack and difficulty in 625. In fact, part of the city was burned to the ground in 625, but the actual full destruction of the city didn't happen until 612 B.C. So, all right, with all that history in our background, now we're looking at Nahum, starting in chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And this is this first part is where God talks about how he judges his enemies. So it says, The oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the um, Elkishite, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. The Lord takes vengeance against his foes. He is furious with his enemies. Now let's stop right there and think about this. And it's a bit of a conundrum because we've talked about this before. It's not really a conundrum, but by the way you and I look at things, it could appear that way. Because God, you remember, God is the one that put Israel into captivity to these very people. Um, remember, Nineveh is, is the capital Syria, uh, city of Assyria. And so God is the one that, is, that sold Israel into captivity to Assyria. But because of the way Assyria treated them, judgment was being brought on them. So you need to understand, God needed to judge his people one way or the other. Assyria was a growing and mounting power in the area, and they were conquering all the other um, um, 
uh, smaller nations around them. And so God's like, you know what? They're convenient. They're right here. I'll just go ahead and hand them over to, to Assyria anyway, because Assyria already wants to destroy them anyway, or, or, or capture them anyway. So I'll just, but I'm not going to sell Judah into their hand. I'm just going to sell the Northern kingdom because of their sins, especially the ones that had multiplied under Ahab and Jezebel. And, uh, so anyway, so uh, God sold them over to Assyria, but then the way Assyria handled their captivity, the way they mistreated them and were cruel and, uh, and so on, God eventually, at the end of the Northern Kingdom's captivity, he brought judgment back on Assyria for the way they had treated his people. So, um, so he used them. But he did not set up how they treated them. Just like we see with, uh, with again, we like go back to our, our bedrock example of Pharaoh. God is the one that handed Israel over to, um, uh, to Egypt and sold them uh, to, to, to them, you know, long before they were actually in slavery. And, uh, um, but be, and God tried to get Pharaoh to be agreeable and let the people go. And if he, they had, God probably would not have punished Israel, Egypt at all. Um, even though he had, they had mistreated his people, he would have, you know, probably let sleeping dogs lie. But, um, he, you know, so God, we know that God placed Pharaoh in power, but how Pharaoh acted as ruler was according to Pharaoh's free will. He had every right to act the way he wanted to, and he was he was mean and and and, and harsh to Israel, and so he was judged. Uh, based on that. And so the same thing's happening here with the Syrians. And of course, it will eventually happen with Babylon, which we will read other nights. But tonight we're looking at Assyria. So when you read here where it says, the Lord is jealous and an avenging God, and the Lord that takes vengeance and, and is fierce in wrath, and the Lord takes vengeance against his foes and furious with his enemies, it's a beautiful thing that God sees Israel's enemies as his enemies. But it might seem as a little bit of a conflict of interest in your mind because of the fact that you're like, well, God's the one that sold them to Assyria in the first first place. So, and now he's turning around and angry with them because they took them in, um, into, into captivity. Well, this is where Paul's words in Romans 9 fall into play. And that is, uh, the, the, the pot does not have right to say to the potter, why have you made me this way? Um, uh, now, God did not predetermine how Assyria would act. That was their free will actions. But nonetheless, God as judge has got a right to hand people over to another country and then in the end punish that very same country for taking them to captivity. He's got that right. Um, God did not create any of these reactions in these people. These people were free to act the way they wanted to. Assyria was mean and harsh to Israel all on their own. God did not influence them to do that. And like I said, and I understand it's an argument from silence because it didn't happen, so we don't know what would have happened. But if Pharaoh, way, way, way back, using them as the bedrock example, if Pharaoh had just let God's people go and just stopped at that, it's very possible that God would not have brought any retribution back on Egypt at all, even for the years that they had mistreated Israel, because in the end, they were they were they were responsive to God and let their people his people go. Um, so and again, that's an argument from silence because Pharaoh didn't do that. So we really don't know how God would have reacted. But knowing God like we do, as we have learned progressively as we're going through the Bible, it's the kind of way God would be. He doesn't. He tries to deal with people where they are, not just solely based on what they have done. And so if Pharaoh were, had, were to have let the people go, that would have been tantamount to repenting for the way he had treated Israel. And God would probably would have been very, very lenient in his judgment over Egypt. And so therefore, I imagine he probably would have been here as well. But uh, Assyria had already had an opportunity to repent and did. And uh, I went back historically and looked, and I guess this was probably the second king since Jonah went there and they repented. Since then, two more kings had come up into power. One had passed away and the other one had taken the reins. And that was the guy that was reigning when this happened. And they had gotten back into power. They'd gotten pious and, 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 and prideful again and full of themselves. And they were also nasty people. They weren't nice uh, to the people that they conquered. And so therefore, God's like, you know what? I'm done. You know, I gave you a chance to repent and you did. Good for you. But now you've completely fallen away from that. And I'm not going to give you a third chance. We're done. 
So that's where we are here. So that, I just wanted to, again, give you a framework to put this in because you, know, you can see how um, it could be confusing in the mind of some people. Why would God sell them into these people's hands and then punish them for taking them? Well, this is why. So anyway, I'm picking back up in verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea so that it dries up, and he makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and, Car and Carmel wither, even the flower of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his burning anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. Even the rocks are shattered before him. Now, starting in verse 7, he begins to describe how merciful he is, and on the other side of the issue, how merciful he is to those who trust in him, which brings to a head the big problem. Assyria is being judged for the way that they have mounted up in pride and acted like God themselves and have tried to rule other nations without themselves submitting to the God of heaven. Um... But ultimately, what this is really is, is this is an issue of trust. The reason why Assyria does what it does is, number one, it, it, it had the power to do it. And in their arrogance, they thought it was by the power of our, our own hands, through our own military brilliance, through our own skill and deafness at war, that we were able to conquer these people and bring all this wealth and all this power into our own hands. And the Bible tells us that that power and um, authority come from God. That if a person is lifted up high, God's the one that placed them there. Um, we also know that God, sometimes with the wicked, it says he puts their feet in slippery places so that their end comes suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, right when they think that everything is as good as it can get is usually when destruction happens. And by the way, that's exactly what happened here with Nineveh because they had, they had already accumulated so many other vassal states and other vassal kings that were underneath them. And this was literally the height of their power and their, their wealth. They were economically above almost everyone. And at that, that it was at that very moment when they thought that they were completely in, uh, um, invulnerable is when God brought destruction. So, uh, he, he's making an example of them. So, you know, so this is, this is an important thing, but, uh, but, uh, the reason why I say this is about trust is because he brings up how these people are his enemies. And then he begin, and, and that God does not let his enemies go free. He fully judges them. But then he says, verse 7, The Lord is good and is a stronghold in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him, who trust in him. Which is, what is he saying by, by, uh, um, by comparison? He's saying that Assyria never placed their trust in God. They trust in their own strength and the power of their own hand, and they believe that it's through their own cunning and, and craftiness and power and wealth that they were able to be such a ruling power on the earth. And God's like, no, I, I gave that to you, and now because you can't play well with others, I'm taking it away from you. Um, if you had just trusted me, you could have maintained your wealth, and you could have maintained your city, and you could have, you know, I would have blessed you. But, you know, because what does it say here? God says the Lord is good and is a stronghold in a day of distress, and he cares for those who take refuge in him. If Assyria had maintained their uh, their repentance that they uh, obtained and they walked in under Jonah, then this day would not have come. Because they would have been seen as people who trusted in God, and they took refuge in him. And you could see that, if you remember last week in Jonah, it was very clear. The king, everyone up to the king, repented in sackcloth and ashes, and, and, and uh, mourned, and, and fasted, and, uh, and, and set out their mouth that, per, you know, we've done wickedly, and perhaps if we repent, um, uh, the Almighty God will not judge us. Maybe he'll be lenient with us. Um, so they did this not even knowing if they were going to get um, a reprieve because Jonah's um, message was not repent or it was God's going to bring destruction in X number of days. Get ready for it. Um, and they repented because the Spirit of the Lord was upon them and they felt guilt for what they had done. They responded accordingly. And so in all 
on uh, by all outward you know expressions and uh, um considerations they were taking refuge in the very god who said i'm going to kill you in a few days um they they just pretty much threw themselves on the mercy of the court if you will and god was merciful um but then as i said they they in the next generation or so they regressed from that went back into their pride and so god's judging them so anyway uh, but again it's always an issue of trust when Assyria was set aside from judgment and and the judgment did not come, it's because they placed trust in God. It is when they trusted in themselves and not God that they got into trouble. So verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him, but he will completely destroy Nineveh with an overwhelming flood, and he will chase his enemies into darkness. Whatever you plot against the Lord, he will bring it to complete destruction. Oppression will not rise up a second time. It had risen up that rose up the first time. Jonah came to them, they repented, but he said, I'm not dealing with it a second time. For they will be consumed like entangled thorns, like a drunkard's drink, um, and like straw that is fully dry. One has gone one has gone out from Nineveh who plots evil against the Lord and is a wicked counselor. This is what the Lord says. Though um, though they are strong and numerous, they will still be mowed down, and he will pass away. Now, God begins to promise at this point, in the middle of this, he begins to shift his attention to his people and promises to free his people from Assyria. With, in the middle of the sentence, he says, For though I have afflicted you, this is talking now about Israel, I will afflict you no longer. I will now break off his, meaning Assyria's, yoke from you and tear off your shackles. The Lord has issued an order concerning you. There will be no offspring to carry on you. Now he's shifting back over to Assyria again. This is you got to really pay attention when you're watching prophecy because in prophecy they rarely, you know, if you're if you're re reading a Shakespearean play or something like that, it'll say, um, you know, in steps so and so, and you know who's speaking and who they're speaking to. Prophecy doesn't work that way. Um, so you just have to read and see what's, say, what's being said, and then you know who he's talking to. So that one, two sentences there, though I have afflicted you, I'll afflict you no longer, for I will break off his yoke from you and tear his shackles off of you. That's a good thing. He's saying that to Israel. But now he shifts his attention back to Assyria, particularly Nineveh, and says, the Lord has issued an order concerning you. There will be no more offspring to carry on your name. I will eliminate the carved idol and cast image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. Look to the mountains, the feet of one bringing good news and proclaiming peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah. Fulfill your vows, for the wicked one will never again march through you. He will be entirely wiped out. Now move on to chapter 2. It says, One who scatters is coming up against you. Man the fortifications. Watch the road. Brace yourself. Summon all your strength. For the Lord will restore the majesty of Jacob. Yes, the majesty of Israel, through ra though ravagers have ravaged them and ruined their vine branches. They are what? Their vine branches. Remember, I've been telling you how Israel was God's choice vine under the old covenant. Under the new covenant, Jesus becomes the vine and we are the branches. So, but here's just another reference to them um, as a, as um, vine and branches. <clears throat> Verse 3. <clears throat> The shields of his warriors are, draw, are dyed red. The valiant men are dressed in scarlet. The fittings of the chariots flash like fire on the day of, it, of its battle preparations, and the spears are brandished. The chariots dash madly through the streets. They rush around in the plazas. They look like uh, torches. They dart back and forth like lightning. He gives orders to his officers. They stumble as they advance. They, ra they race um, to its walls. The protective shield is in its place. The river gates are opened, and the palace erodes away. <clears throat> Beauty is stripped. She, she is carried away. Her ladies in waiting moan like the sound of doves and beat their breasts. Um, Nineveh has been like a pool of water from her, um, from her first days, but they are fleeing. Stop! Stop! They cry out, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver! Plunder the gold! There is no end to the treasures and abundance of every precious thing. Desolation, de uh, desolation, decimation, devastation, hearts melt, knees tremble, loins shake, every face grows pale. Where is the lion's lair? 
or the feeding grounds of the young lions where the lion and the lion is proud and the lion cubs with nothing to frighten them away. The lion, the lion mauled whatever its cubs needed and strang strangled prey for its lionesses. If it fills up the dens with the kill and its layers are mauled prey. Now, of course, this being um, metaphorically uh, regarding um, Assyria, but I just thought it was interesting when I read this because it shows the lion being the one doing the killing and bringing the prey back to the lair. And in today's day of, of feminism gone completely insane, um, uh, this affects everything. I mean, it affects everything. Uh, it, you, you have to look for a while to find uh, the truth even about lions. Uh, because lionesses are now set forth as the only hunter-gatherers for pride, while the male lions do nothing but lay around and do and, and um, you know and literally do nothing. Um, however, such is not the case. Um, while female lions do in fact hunt prey very efficiently, so do lions. The lionesses will prey in coordinated packs with other lionesses. In other words, the female lions. While well, lion, while uh, lions will prey all by themselves, and they do so by stealth. Both are very effective. Um, in most cases, hunting is often done by the females, but that is so that the lions may stay back to protect the pride. Um, but in reality, it is not really an issue of male versus female. It's both, providing for their pride as they may. Um, so, you know, my, my, the reason why I bring it up is because, you know, I had learned a number of years back that lions don't do any hunting at all. It's always the lionesses. And so I thought, well, this is kind of an odd statement then. Why is it saying that the lion did the hunting? And so I did a little bit of research and come to find out that, uh, in fact, lions do hunt and more than they ever thought that they did. But they hunt um, evidently more at nighttime and they do it by stealth, whereas the female lions or the lionesses, they hunt in packs, coordinated packs, and often do it during the day. Both are extremely effective. Um, and so both wind up providing for providing for the uh, um, the pride, but uh, um, there are cases where just the lion goes out and does it. So anyway, just a side thought. But if you had ever heard that in your, you know, uh, when you may watch maybe watch the Animal Channel or something like that, it may have brought up a question in your mind. And there's your answer. So, verse thirteen says, "Beware, I'm against you. The declaration of the Lord of Hosts: I will make your chariots go up in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions." I'll cut off your prey from the earth, and the sound of your messengers will never be heard again. Now we're on the third and final chapter, starting in verse 1. It says, Woe to the city of blood, totally deceitful, full of plunder, never without prey. The crack of the whip and the rumble of the wheel and galloping horses and jolting chariot, charging horsemen, flashing sword, shining spear, heaps of slain, mounds of cor corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over their dead. Because of the continual prostitution of the prostitute, the attractive mistress of sorcery, who betrays nations by her prostitution and clans by her witchcraft, I am against you, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face and display your nakedness to the nations, your shame, uh, uh, your shame to the kingdoms. I will throw filth on you and treat you with contempt. I will make a spectacle of you. Then all who see you will recoil from you, saying, Nineveh is devastated. Who will go show sympathy to her? Where can I go, go to find anyone to comfort you? Are you better than Thebes that sat along the Nile uh, with water surrounding her, whose rampart was the sea and the river her wall? Remember, this is the same people I was just bringing up to you earlier when I said was talking about the dating of this book. Thebes had already fallen here and is being set up as an example to Nineveh. If Thebes attached to Egypt, who was surrounded on all sides by water as a peninsula, uh, was able to be overcome and, and destroyed, um, how do you think you're going to get away from anything, Nineveh? So it's being used as an example, but obviously Thebes had already come to destruction, and so therefore we know for a fact that this prophecy had to be after that date. Verse 9, Cush and Egypt were her endless sources of strength. Put and Libya were among her allies. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her children were also dashed to pieces at the heads of every street. They cast lots for her dignitaries, and all her nobles were bound in chains. You also will become drunk. You, uh, you will hide yourself. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are fig trees with figs that, uh, um, that ripened first. When shaken, they fall right into the mouth of the eater. 
Look, your troops are women among you. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. He's saying, in other words, what you think is strength is actually weakness. Um, fire will devour the bars of your gates. Draw water from your uh, for the siege. Strengthen your for uh, fortresses. Um, step into the clay and tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mold. You need this is an interesting thing because in verse thirteen it says fire fire will devour the bars of your gate, which is quite literally what wound up happening. Um, uh, th that one of the ways in which they were laid siege was by fire. About a good portion of the city was burnt. So, uh, um, so this is something that had not happened yet, and yet uh, Nahum is being able to see this vision as he was sleeping um, uh, long before it took place and was very accurate. Verse 15, the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you down, it will devour you like the young locust, multiply uh, yourselves like the young locust, multiply like the swarming locust. You've made your merchants more numerous than the stars in the sky. Your young locusts strip the land and fly away. Your court officials are like swarming locusts, and your scribes are like clouds of locusts, which settle on the walls on a cold day. When the sun rises, they take off, and no one knows where they are. King of Assyria, your shepherds slumber. Your officials sleep. Your people are scattered across the mountains with no one to gather them together. There is no remedy for your injury. Your wound is severe. All who hear the news about you will clap their hands because of you. For, for um, who has not experienced um, uh, your constant cruelty? Because these people were, like I said, Assyria was a horrible nation. They were very, very mean, uh, cruel people. And like we read earlier, literally, they're dead were just heaped up uh, to the point where chariots were having a hard time going anywhere because they'd run over all the dead people that were everywhere. So it was a, a, they were a terrible group of people, and God was bringing judgment on them. So uh, and in, so you understand now that uh, Nahum was after uh, Jonah, but very likely before Zephaniah. It was after 663, which was the fall of Thebes, and it was all regarding Assyria, um, who Nineveh is the capital city of, because Assyria was the ones who had taken Israel into captivity, greater Israel, northern kingdom, into, into captivity, and they were cruel to them. So um, God had pronounced this, ju this judgment over them. So God had much to say about Nineveh. Um, now, uh, that's really all there was uh, to this. Uh, uh, next week, we will probably begin with Amos and Hosea, which date to between 790 and 750 B.C., and largely cover uh, the straying of the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, it predates what we've been talking about, but again, the reason why we did it in this order was because of the fact that the, the chapters that we read after Jeremiah were dated about the same time as Jeremiah. So I thought it might might provide some amount of you know uh, consistency and congruity um, in, in, in your hearing of it. But now we're having to back up a little bit and deal with some of the other minor prophets that were before that. So Amos and Hosea deal largely cover the time of the northern kingdom straying from God um, and allying themselves with Assyria, which eventuated in them being taken captive to Syria. The same Assyria that we just heard was destroyed uh, through the prophecy um, following the prophecy of Nahum. Um, then after we deal with Amos and Hosea, we will probably move on to Isaiah and Micah, which are towards the end of the 8th century, uh, at which point we will have covered all of the minor prophets um, whose ministries were during or about the times preceding the return of Judah from Babylonian exile. So, um, so again, next week, very likely, we're going to start looking at Amos and Hosea. So uh, now I open up the floor if anybody has any questions or statements or thoughts. Uh, go right ahead. Mark. Yes. It just sort of brings home to us as far as today how even though we may look at things that people are doing and that they seem to be getting along much better even though they're not believers yeah. yet you know it's it's not for us to make that decision because god's going to watch out for his children yeah. and as such i think that we can just take some comfort in knowing that uh, you know it's he's true to his word he's the same yesterday today and forever so mm -hmm. we have no I mean, it, it happens. I'm, I fall into things that keep thinking, oh, wow, you know, 
start comparing a little bit and it'd be mm -hmm. nice if, but then it's just got to stop and think, God, you have me where I, where you want me. I'm within your arms and I can just rest in that and take, take comfort Yeah. without having to realize that, you know, or, or, or she says before, you know, you know, vengeance is his, not ours. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. And allowing God to write our story. Uh, I was just yes. reading a post um, from a young man that I, I very much care about, um, who I taught in middle school over there at uh, at uh, Palmetto um, Christian, back when it was Palmetto Christian. A uh, great young man. He had uh, what was considered to be a learning disability, but in reality, it was just because he was just too smart um, and therefore was over analytical and some basic instructions. He couldn't reconcile what was being asked to actually make it happen because it didn't make sense to him. And uh, when you would, exp you had to take some special time with him, but once he understood it and could reconcile why this made sense to do it, he could do it excellently with excellence. So he was a great young man, but, um, and he's now approaching his thirties and he just put a, um, a post on Facebook that tomorrow was his birthday. And he was talking about how things have changed over the years in his life. And that this next year that he's, he's very much focused on trying to, um, uh, essentially give the Lord the lead of his life um, and uh, and quit trying to micromanage everything and uh, mm. um, allow him to uh, to take the lead and and see where that goes rather than trying to set his own goals and manipulate the outcome through his own strength. And I'm like, dude, man, if, if you can learn that That's lesson great. at your age, you're going to be light years <laughs> beyond most of us. So, uh, But it falls into something similar to what you're talking about. I mean, uh, if Assyria had 